United Against Cancer. Hello, everyone. Good day, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. My name is Zainab Shinkafi Bagudu. I am the founder CEO of Medicaid Cancer Foundation, a nonprofit in Nigeria, a board member of the Union for International Cancer Control. And I work with various government agencies and also serve as a senior advisor to the coordinating minister of health of Nigeria. You're welcome to this week's edition of United Against Cancer, our series of conversation with various cancer advocates, researchers, and you know, very influential people and stakeholders in the cancer ecosystem. Today, we have a very special guest, and I will tell you why he's special to later. He has a very extensive bio, so I'm going to just read a little bit of it. And he's a patient advocate, a psychologist, a global health consultant, and the executive director of Project Pink Blue, a cancer nonprofit operating in Nigeria. He supports people battling cancer and established the first patient navigation in Nigeria in 2015, founded the Abuja Breast Cancer Support Group in 2017, and he's also the founder of the Network of People Impacted by Cancer in Nigeria, which coincidentally, you will hear my connection with as well very soon. Uh, he's won various prizes, both nationally and globally, including the 2020 Global Ties US Award for Social Innovation and Change, uh, the International Gynecologic Cancer Society Distinguished Advocacy Award, and the 2023 Rising Star Made with Patients Award by the Patients Open Engagements Open Forum. He's also one. Uh, I'm looking for a particular one that he the the your prize the prize from the UICC. Anyway, we'll come to it later. <laughs> Um, my guest today, as some of you would have guessed, because he's a very well-known face in the cancer space, is Mr. Ronsi Chidebe. And like I said, he's the executive director of Project Pink Blue. Ronsi, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to have you, and I hope you're doing well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really, really uh, feel so honored to have this very exciting conversation with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Now, I promise to tell you why Ronsi is special, and I will do it in the beginning before we get to the end. Today, Ronsi is a face that a lot of people in Nigeria, in Africa, and globally associate with cancer advocacy. And he builds this by himself over the last, should I say, 15 years. And um, I met Ronsi as a young graduate. He had just come out of university. And in Nigeria, we have what we call the NYSC. Uh, that's a national youth service program where all youths are mandated to spend a year doing a compulsory service to the nation. And at the time, Ronsi decided he wanted to do his community projects in cervical and breast cancer awareness. And that was the birth of Project King Blue. He had a community awareness program, looked around town and thought, who are the people that can support me and are doing uh, cancer programs, found Medicaid and he came to us and the rest is history. I have watched him grow with a lot of pride and joy in so many ways over the years and build, I've seen him build uh, the organization that today uh, we all know as Project Pink Blue, as well as other credible organizations. So Ronsi, it's a pleasure for me to be here talking to you in this position today. I am so proud of you as always. I always, I don't shy away from saying this and I'm pleased that we have the opportunity to do it today. 
So in your very extensive bio, is there any points that I have left out? He, he sits on so many boards, the World Ovarian Cancer Coalition, the Global Steering Committee for Novartis, uh, on the UICC World Cancer Day Advisory Group, and also an external board member of the Birmingham, Lewisham, African and Caribbean Health Inequities Review in the UK. Uh, he's published a great load of uh, articles and publications, peer review journals, 40 under 40 cancer advocacy, distinguished advocacy, so many. Well done, Ronsi. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think Ma, one, one thing you missed in my bio is that you missed to name me, name me as one of the people you've mentored. <laughs> That's true. Well, I described this. I, I've watched him grow. I've helped him where I could help him. i mentored him, given him advice. I remember yeah. one particular day when he came to the office to see me and he said, you know, I have problems getting patients to share their experience, you know, and we talked about various options and I know that he went through with this and he was going through that frustration of getting patients in our environments to destigmatize their disease and speak about this in a way that would be helpful to others. And today in Abuja, when you talk about patient groups, you have to go to Project Pink Blue. In Nigeria, in fact, you have to engage with Project Pink Blue. When I get asked, oh, let's do this, let's do that support group and so on, I say, okay, we can do it, but let's call the people from Project Pink Blue. So well done, Ronsi. You've created a niche for yourself and uh, it's been very helpful. So let's start. <laughs> so we know a lot about the work that you're doing, uh, the extensive advocacy work that you do, supporting patients, uh, both within and outside Nigeria, raising funds, and um, the, the, the work that you do in publications as well, and bringing to attention, focus, the inequities that exist. Um, what do you believe, how do you think we can make progress with the inequities, maybe just let us know some of the inequities that you see in cancer as an advocate nationally and internationally, and how can we try to employ some of these best practices? I mean, I would really start by saying that a cancer patient in Lagos, Nigeria, and a cancer patient in Accra, and a cancer patient in probably in Dallas, Texas, or you know, in Kuala Lumpur is the same cancer patient. What really, really differ or what separates these cancer patients, it's really what they have access to, the kind of medication they have access to, the kind of healthcare workforce that we're able to take care of them, and the kind of healthcare system that they were able to, 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 to utilize. So the crucial issue as we speak today is that the global inequity is so wide. For instance, a continent like Africa that has over 1 billion people. Today, today we just have only 109 oncology clinical trials mm. in the entire continent. If you compare this to the clinical trials that are happening in other parts of the world, you will be shocked. And when patients are not included in clinical trials, uh, unfortunately, we don't even know if those medications are going to work better on them because they were not used to really understand the efficacy of these medications. Uh, the other challenge is, is there are so many technologies that are coming up every single day in helping to provide the best radiation care, providing the best diagnoses that are tailored. Most of these are also not available. So I really think that there are multiple ways that we can begin to rethink what we mean by global health. And anytime people talk about global health, when I go for conferences, I get really mad because global health, it's still not truly global health. People just talk about it as a way for them to get maybe funding, or, you know, or as a strategy for them to show that 
they are committed to the world. So when we talk about global health, we talk about global cancer control, I am still unsure if anything like that truly, 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 truly has really reached to the level that people talk about it. Yeah, so these are all the big issues. These are all the big top mm -hmm. policy, high level issues that global leaders need to interrogate. Mm -hmm. And some of the ways I believe we can sort it is first of all, redefining that, redefining mm -hmm. that and ensuring that people who are underrepresented, people who are marginalized, are able to find support. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you for that, Ronsi. So a lot of um, points you raised there in terms of clinical trials, in terms of drugs, in terms of access to issues like radiation, and not just limited to Africa, but across um, LMICs in particular, and the need to really holistically own the issue for all of us and um, you know, address it as a funding issue that needs to be really looked at. In, in your experience, how would you say the best partnerships are formed? Project Pink Blue is a very well-known organization with various partners, some of whom we know, uh, both locally and internationally, and you have been able to do a lot through these partnerships. So what kind of partnerships are we looking for when we want to be intentional about closing the care gap? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, so I think um, that the kind of partnership that really make a lot of uh, impact is those kind of partnership that actually were defined by the patients themselves. So one of the biggest challenge we have today is in most cancer engagement, people don't even think about patients. You see very big meetings, you see very big events, very big deals and very big partnerships that are being discussed on cancer survivorship, cancer diagnosis, cancer treatment, cancer funding. You will not find a cancer patient in the room. Mm. And you'll be asking, how would you want to form a partnership to save the life of patient, and then the patient are not there to provide their own patient experience. Mm. So we need to begin to always think about what exactly do we want to talk? What exactly do we want to change? Who are the best people that can bring the best input? And at Project Pin Blue, we have been working really hard to see how we can integrate that cancer patient and ensure that the cancer patients are at the forefront of every decision we make, you know? Mm -hmm. And that has been very useful in some of the partnership we've formed, like the upgrade oncology, um, you know, Ma, as you, you are aware today, um, um, oncology workforce is the biggest problem we have in Nigeria, and, and I mean in most African country, mm -hmm. you know? There are so many African countries today that have just only one oncologist, mm -hmm. and some of them have over 10,000 and 20,000 cancer patient incidents every single year. And they have just only one oncologist or two. Some even don't have. In Nigeria only have less than 80, 000, less than 80 oncologists for 120,000 cancer patients. So <laughs> we asked ourselves one big question. We asked ourselves, what are the biggest issues that we as an organization need to face to help to address the the poor treatment outcome. So we ask the patient, technically, what many organizations would do is to donate to hospitals, to donate to them and to reach out to the hospitals and know what machines they could give to the hospital. But when we ask patients, what, what do you guys think are the biggest problem? Mm. Patient told us that the biggest problem they have is that their doctors are amazing. However, their doctors don't have enough time for them. So did you see? So, but me as a non-patient and other people as a non-patient were thinking the doctors were horrible, like the doctors are bad. But the patient are telling you because they are the one experiencing this. They are the one that can give the best feedback. They say they have the best doctors in Nigeria, but the doctors are not giving them enough time. Mm. And we investigated deeper. 
we realize that clinical workload is the biggest problem the doctors are facing. Absolutely. Most Nigerian doctors are so patriotic that they don't want to leave Nigeria because of their patients. But the doctors also have the same problem that the patient had, that the doctors want to spend more time with their patient. And when they do that, they have more satisfaction with themselves. Amazing. So fascinating <laughs> for us. And then we, start, we interrogated further and asked the patient, what do you think we can do better to improve the kind of treatment outcome that you get from these doctors? They were like, they think some doctors need to be trained. For them to be trained to understand the newer things that their patient are seeing from Dr. Gugu. Mm. That when they talk to their doctor about, they see it from their face, observe from their face that the doctors are not aware of it. So did you see how the patient engagement, the patient insight has helped us as an organization to understand the best kind of project, the best kind of partnership we could fund? And that was how we reached out to the U.S. government. And we say, hey, U.S. government, you know, you guys have been taking me around across the world. You take me to the U.S. You want me to travel around the U.S. This is the time I want the U.S. people to come to Nigeria, to also travel around Nigeria to, be, to also experience what we're doing. And that's how we created um, Upgrade Oncology in 2018. Mm -hmm. And through that partnership, we've actually brought in almost, I think, about six to seven um, U.S. expert professors in oncology pharmacy, professors in, in medical oncology, nurses, um, both pathologists. We're also hoping to dive into surgery. So I believe those kind of partnerships are usually useful to the people when it is down, you know, bottom up, rather than some people sitting in New York with AC fitted buildings and cross their leg with night suits and decide that they have a plan for Africa and they have a plan for Sub-Saharan Africa. And they bring this plan down, it's not usually sustainable. It doesn't make the kind of difference that um, you know, those people in those bottom really want. Amazing. A lot of very interesting points there, particularly the outcome or the findings uh, that we often think that, yes, with medical people, they think on a medical line, and then the patients are more uh, to things to do with emotions and support and so on. But to find that even the medical people uh, actually require more time with their patients so that they can have better outcomes is truly interesting. And of course, the work that you're doing with the Upgrade Oncology Program, amazing work being able to bring in healthcare professionals at a very high level into the country so that they can impact their knowledge. And this skills transfer is really very important and a way that we can uh, even start to train and help our the people that are staying back in LMICs to improve their skills without necessarily leaving the shores of whichever country they are. If we do more of this, then it might... Uh, solve some of the reasons that we so often hear for the professional flights that we're currently going through uh, with the health workforce. Thank you so much, Ronsi. Now let's come home a little bit to the civil society space. And um, I know that every year, uh, one of the programs that you carry out at Project Pink Blue, uh, you offer free screenings, particularly around the World Cancer Day in February and uh, you solicit for partnerships around and offer free screenings uh, for cancer pay, for free cancer screenings. And also uh, you raise funds to treat cancer patients. Famously, every year, Ronsi on his birthday, he doesn't want any present from us. He asks us to, he picks one patient and we have to donate to that patient instead of buying him gifts, a very selfless and um, uh, laudable uh, way of celebrating your birthday, Ronsi. Now, from all these screenings, uh, at the F Medicaid Foundation, we do similar. Have you noticed a change in the trend over the years of um, the willingness, should I say, the participation of the communities? When you head into a community, how do they receive you? And how would you say the the screening has helped us to move the needle in cancer 
uh, control. Then the second part of that question would be, as civil society, we're often working in silos, doing a lot of laudable work. How can we include our work within the national policy and government system to make it more impactful. You are a member of the National Cancer Control Committee and so many other committees that go on in Nigeria that have to do with policy and um, creating programs for cancer. So how can we help make that better? It's a very long question, but you know, give us your own two cents. <laughs> yeah, so Ma, um, the first thing I would really say is that, um, uh, Nigeria has really moved from the years upon which people are really so scared of, of cancer to that level that people are now seeking to understand cancer more. That is what I am seeing. I know several years ago, so many people were really aware of cancer. However, most of them do not have accurate awareness of cancer. But that is changing gradually. And I can say that social media has been the power of change in cancer control in Nigeria. And I think that is also being replicated in other parts of the world. Because now people can just open their phone on Twitter, on, on all the other platform, and they are able to get some information on cancer. That is really phenomenal. But I think what we need to do as, as a country right now is to build on that to ensure that people are having the accurate and consistently accurate information on cancer. Because the challenge is that as we all are going out there to provide cancer information as civil society, there are some people who are interested in making money that are providing other informations that are promoting vaccine hesitancies mm. that are really changing the minds of people to think that if you take HPV vaccine, this will happen to you, this will happen to you, and all those kind of conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. And I also think another thing we need to continue to do is to use multimedia platforms. Like what you're doing, what the, you are doing with the Uncle Daily. I think this is really valuable because we are getting to that level where people no longer read. People these days just want to listen to multimedia, audiovisual materials. So I believe this is so, so important because years in two years, people just tune in this video and they are watching it, they are doing something else, but they are listening mm -hmm. to what you are saying. Mm -hmm. And we have also applied this in our research. Um, in the research we did on cancer health for workforce the research we did on, um, on cancer patient navigation, we also went ahead to transform this research into simple press release on newspapers because not everyone have access to journals. Mm. So that is one thing I would say. Nigeria has made remarkable progress in cancer control. And I would really give that to the government. I will give that credit to the CSO and to the government. And I'll tell you why, because people will be shocked that I'm giving a credit to the government because they know I'm always like, always saying no <laughs> government is not doing enough. <laughs> but I will say why. Why I think so is because this is the first time in several years that we're seeing ministers of health and we're seeing president, wife of God, wife of a uh, president are taking more drastic action in cancer control. They're being more proactive. A bit more proactive. We're seeing cancer on headline news, unlike mm. before. So this is mm. commendable. All we as CSO need to do now is to hold them accountable. Mm. We did it. Because in March of 2020 was the first time the Vice President, Yemi Osibanjo, announced in the first time that HB vaccine will be added into national routine vaccination. And since 2020, 2020, we eventually had it in 2023, but we were all tweeting, you know, we we're all, <laughs> in fact, including you, including you, <laughs> including you, you were. That was, that was a beautiful tag team. When we go six months, then I say, Ronsi, let's bring up that tweet. And so we dig up the video of the vice president promising us HPV. Exactly. And then 
you know, run with it again. And we still don't have HPV. But thank God we have it today. The we end justifies it. the means. And I'm yeah. sure they know it was from a good yeah. place. And so the reality is that um, we need to continue to engage the government. We need to tell the government when they're doing well and tell them when they're not doing well. Mm. And I keep saying it, I don't hate any government. I love every government. I don't, I only just, um, you know, I only love my patient more than I love government and any other person. Mm. It's so unfortunate. Mm. Why do I love my patient more is that Every single day of my life, I get text messages, I get emails of patients that are battling with one disease or the other. There mm. is no human being with a conscience that will be in the situation and the state that I am and will not love to support cancer patients and fight for cancer patients. So, you know, bouncing to the second question you asked, how can we as CSO work more with the government? I think the question, it's such an empowerful question because so many CSOs, are battling with understanding how best to do this. And this is what I will say from my own experience, which might not be the best experience. Tell, try and tell yourself the truth and believe that you could find yourself with cancer tomorrow. And anyone could be a cancer patient. You know, there is someone, it could be our parents, it could be our brother, it could be our sister. If anyone, if no human being is immune to cancer, then we should know that we can really make a remarkable progress if mm -hmm. we all did not believe that we are potential cancer patients. And on this premise, I strongly believe that CSOs across the country are really missing it at some point. And I can tell you mm -hmm. the truth. They are missing it in the sense that most CSOs dive more in cancer awareness and do less in cancer advocacy. However, they all tell you they do cancer advocacy. This is the same also across Africa. Many of our organizations are all involved in cancer awareness. And the reality is that it's different. Cancer awareness is just when you are creating awareness, educating the public, right? Cancer advocacy, it's you are trying to change practice. You are trying to change a policy and you cannot do that without government. Mm -hmm. You cannot. Government is one of the most powerful tools to bring a change anywhere after people. People mm -hmm. are number one, but government is number two. But the thing is that uh, you see, I will give you an example. Project Pink Blue has been existing for the past 10 years or so, right? And the number of people we have screened have not even been up to 1 million people. But with one single government policy today, right, mm -hmm. that every woman who attends Antinental must get breast cancer or cervical cancer screening, or any man who attends any form of care in the hospital must get prostate-specific antigen tests. You'll be shocked that in less than one year, over 50 million people will be screened. Mm -hmm. So why can't we engage the system that we know that can really change everything that we've been doing? And I keep saying it. I'm doing what I'm doing to that project because I want to lose my job <laughs> and the government to do their job. Because right now, we're all doing the work the government's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So to answer the question in a very smart way, I would say that we all need to engage in advocacy and continue mm -hmm. to engage the government to understand that we are doing your job. We want you to do your job and we don't hate you. We want to work with you. We want to see how we can really work together to make a difference in our community. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.